Hi, I'm Jean Shaproff and I'm on a mission. Anyone can be a philanthropist. My television show came from my book, Successful Philanthropy, How to Make a Life by What You Give. Won't you join me? Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shaparoff, and today's show is all about highlighting a very important philanthropic leader. Her name, Susan Taylor. Susan was the head of Essence Magazine for over 30 years. Not only was she editor-in-chief of Essence Magazine, but she also is an author. She's penned many books, and she started her own mentoring charity, a charity that operates in over 57 cities across the United States. Let's all welcome Susan Taylor. Susan, can you tell all of us a little bit about your beginnings? I understand you grew up in Harlem, and, and how did you get to where you got to at Essence Magazine? Oh, it was a, a circuitous route. I'll tell you that. I'm so happy to be with you today. Growing up in Harlem, I grew up in my father's boutique, his ladies' clothing shop, and then Harlem really fell to heroin. I grew up in a safe Harlem. But when heroin was dumped into the community, those of us who were lucky enough, fortunate enough to be in two parent households, we were able to flee. And so we moved out to Queens and that's where I went to high school and graduated from high school. I thought I wanted to be an actress, Jean, but guess what? I wasn't a good actress and I quickly learned that. And I remember understudying Paula Kelly in a three character play on Broadway. And I just said, Lord, if you let me out of this one, I promise I'll find my métier, I'll find my path. I was the only person who was happy that the play closed on opening night. And with that, I went to beauty school. I started a cosmetics company and that led me to Essence where I became the beauty editor of the magazine first, then the fashion and beauty editor, positions I, I served in for 10 years and then moved into the editor-in-chief's position and then editorial director. So I really led the magazine in the chief editorial position for 27 of my 37 years there. Which is a very long time to be absolutely anywhere. And now you as a woman in great power during, during all of those years, who did you interface with? I understand you were, you were at the top of the publishing world as Susan Taylor. Who did you interface with and, and what kind of things did you do in that position that you can talk about and, and share with all of us? You know, I remember the first time I was invited to the White House, it was by Barbara Bush, which was extraordinary. The first time I met Hillary Clinton, uh, all the women's magazine editors were invited to, to the Waldorf Astoria to an exquisite luncheon. And she came down the, 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 the aisle sort of and, and spoke to me and said, oh, the women on my staff, they love your work. They, they read in the spirit, my column. Uh, going to South Africa was probably the height of my experience because all the celebrities, we met them all. They were on covers. We did stories on them. So absolutely. But the day that Nelson Mandela stepped out of prison hold, holding Winnie Mandela's hand, my husband and I watched them as the world did on television. The next day we flew up to Boston and met with his children um, and their families and flew to South Africa with Stedman Graham, who everybody knows is Oprah's beloved, Armstrong Williams, and walked into the Mandela household in Soweto. And so we were there when the media from all over the world, Gene, they descended on that very humble home. They didn't move into the mansion that Oprah built for them yet, but they moved in, they were in that very humble home. And it was just amazing to see the thousands of media organizations lining up to interview him. And what I just want to say about what, whom they call Madiba, Nelson Mandela, we're in the yard with him and he's interviewing each person as though they are the only person he's going to speak to that day. I really learned something about grace and humility from him. Oh, for sure. And he was a, and remains always to be a great influence in, in our world and someone that I look up to and someone who really did a lot for human rights. And you being in your position at Essence Magazine, you were in a situation where you could move mountains um, for especially people of color. And, 
Essence magazine is really a beautiful magazine and, and had a lot to say. And I think mentored many people. And I'm sure you'll agree with that, correct? Well, we, we tried to move mountains. What we, you know what we shifted, what I learned was a consciousness because you know how we grow up as women. We grow up not loving always our looks hoping that we could belong to a different family. It's the rare person, especially girls, who are just satisfied with themselves. And because I was the beauty editor of Essence, a position that I really loved, and it was the height of the Black Power movement, I was able to show the full representation of Black beauty. Women who were as dark as the night and who were as white as snow with blue eyes and all sorts of hairstyles and body shapes. Women who were long and lean, women who were lush, women who were round, short, tall. And I loved that opportunity, being able to really just underscore that each of us is a divine original. Each of us looks different. We feel different. There are how many? Seven billion people on the face of this earth and no two of us look alike. I loved being able to represent the breath of black beauty when I was beauty editor. And you did a good job doing that for sure. And today we've just gone through a terrible time where we've seen a lot of racial injustice and our whole history of this country is one of racial injustice because of slavery and the terrible sins of slavery. And did you address these issues as editor of Essence Magazine? Always, Jean, always, always, always. We, we knew how important it was to bring forward the history because you didn't learn the history in school. I'm at least two decades older than you and I certainly didn't learn it in school. So that's what we did. You know, we made sure that uh, African-Americans in the 1980s, when I became editor in chief in 90s, understood what was sacrificed for the privileges that we enjoy today. And I think that's really what all Americans need to understand. The history of African-Americans is totally unknown. You know, when you think about 400 years of enslavement, um, free labor that really built the wealth of not just this nation, but the entire Western hemisphere. You know what I used to say, Jean? Do you know how many magazines I would have if I didn't have to pay anybody? Dozens of magazines, you know? So the challenges that we have today is that there's such division in our nation. And what we're trying to do at this point with the National Cares Mentoring Movement, you know, my charity, our foundation, we're trying to heal those divides. We're trying to really create America the Beautiful. We, we, we say it, we sing it, and we want to say it from our hearts and mean it. America the Beautiful. Yes. So for our audience, audience we are with Susan Taylor. She was the at the helm of Essence Magazine for 37 years. When she left Essence Magazine, she started her own charity. She's just begun to speak a little bit about it. It's a charity designed to mentor children. I understand she has 150,000 volunteers. And Susan, tell us how you began and where did your big first gift come from? Because this is such an amazing story. Oh gosh, well, the National Cares Mentoring Movement grew out of Essence Cares. After Katrina devastated New Orleans, which is the home of the Essence Festival. The Essence Festival brings African-Americans from all over the country and also black people usually from all over the world. Everybody comes now, half a million people gather in New Orleans. Katrina devastated that city and we lost so many of the people, the hundreds of people who helped, thousands who helped us to launch it and produce the festival. And so I said to the Essence family, we have to do more than just have this. We have to have a party with a deeper purpose. So that gave birth to Essence Cares, a call to action to, to Black Americans to go back to their respective cities and to mentor the children in their cities. Well, because when the call goes out for mentors, Jean, it's white women who are the first responders and then white men, black women, and black men. And we need mentors in reverse order. Black children need to know that there's a black community that cares deeply about them. And we're not, not showing up because we don't care. It's just that it's overwhelming. No matter where you find yourself in this nation as an African-American, there are burdens that you carry that we hardly ever speak about. 
So when I left Essence in 2008, Oprah gave a celebration for me. And that celebration was, it was an amazing night. People gathered here in my home, the, the high-end people who gave good money. And then we went down and had a bigger party for the Essence staff and others who contributed. And that night, you know, on the phone, she had said to me, well, what are you trying to raise? And I said, well, I really want to raise a half a million dollars. She got up on the stage that night and she said, Susan told me she was trying to raise a half a million dollars, but we can't have her run because we're in 58 cities now. I don't want to see her running all over the country trying to raise money. I'm going to double the amount that I know she's aiming at tonight. And we're going to give you a million dollars. I mean, it took the air out of the room. <laughs> we were just stunned. So my husband and I were really the funders at the level that we were able to do of the National Cares Mentoring Movement until Oprah stepped in. And you know what else she did? What else she did, Jean, when she had that relationship with Starbucks? Do you remember that? Oprah's yes. child tea? Mm -hmm. Gave a quarter of the revenue to National Cares, uh, Girls Inc., and two other foundations. So she really has undergirded us in an amazing way. Oprah is an amazing woman and a great philanthropist, someone who is moving mountains, not only for people of color, but she's a great role model. And I know I look at her and I say, wow, I'd love to be like Oprah. Who wouldn't? And I think to hear that she's done this for your charity is, is really wonderful. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about exactly how you go out and mentor. You have 150,000 volunteers. How do you get 150,000 volunteers? That's a very big number. And then you're in the schools, right? You go into the schools and you mentor at the schools. Where else do you mentor? Tell us, give us the details because it's so interesting and it's so needed for all young people to have a mentor can mean the difference between succeeding and not succeeding. All of us have to believe in ourselves. When we're young, we have to have someone around us, a parent, a sibling, a teacher, somebody who believes in us, and then we must believe in ourselves. So what Susan's charity is doing is changing lives the way that lives have to be changed. So Susan, tell us more because this is so interesting. It's so important and your work needs to go on forever and ever. Oh, Jean, thank you. You know, it started just as CARES across the country, 58 cities, recruiting mentors. What we were doing was recruiting mentors. We would go to uh, galas, we would go to NAACP meetings, we would go to churches and recruit Black people to step into able, stable Black people, middle class and wealthy Black people to really step into the communities that we all emerged from at some point, maybe a generation two or three ago. And then once I was in Fort Lauderdale, one of the people who was leading Fort Lauderdale Cares, she told me she was frustrated and I was speaking in Miami. And I said, when I'm in Miami, I'm coming up to Fort Lauderdale to really meet with you. She said, what do I say to a 17 year old who already has two children and for whom there are no summer programs? I was incredulous, 17 and two children. What I saw there at the Seagull School took my breath away. I saw teenagers wrestling book bags, baby bags, car seats, and babies onto school buses. And I thought about my own life. I became a mother at 23. I was married, married to a man who had resources. And yet parenting was overwhelming. So I couldn't even imagine being 14, 15, 13, and being a parent. The next day I was speaking to a group of very, very highly resourced women. And in Miami, it was the it was a, a fa a, the Miami Women's Foundation or something. And I brought those teachers with me and I told what I saw. And that really gave birth, birth to our programmatic work. We have a program that really creates wellness mentoring circles where we bring young people like I just described and those who may have come out of incarceration, those who have lost their way, those who are coming out of very, very poor um, communities and families. And Jean, as you and I have discussed, in low income communities, what you have are poverty schools that are not teaching the children well. And the spike that we see in crime all around the country, people who have resources aren't out there trying to shoot anybody. They're not out there trying to rob anybody. They're home getting ready for work the next morning. And so that's our work. We, we are shifting consciousness 
helping young people all across the country graduate from high school and know that they are smart, that they are able, that they can go to college and we help them with their college essays and we try to help them raise their money because their families don't have that kind of money. So we're really, we're creating America the beautiful because there's enough, there's really enough in this great nation for none of us to be hungry and homeless. I love what you're doing. And if we don't work on the next generation and try to move the next generation or our youngest generation forward, we, we fail as a nation and as a people. And all of us were put on this earth to do something. And it's not just about consuming, but it's about giving back and helping future generations. Because once we're gone, our nation is only as good as what we've allowed it to become. And through education, anyone can change their life, but people need the resources. And you, Susan, know as well as I do, I live in New York City, we have a two-tiered system. We have the private schools, which gives a superior education. And then we have the public schools and the education at the public schools is not so great. And naturally, if you're a low income person, well, you're not going to get a great education in New York City or in many places in the United States. So your charity is changing lives. Now, you have a gala coming up, I understand January 23rd, and that's your birthday too. Tell us how we can get involved, how we can donate, what's the website. And then I want to go back to your life a little bit because you've lived a fascinating life. But give us the website and tell us a little bit about that virtual gala. Well, our website is caresmentoring.org, caresmentoring.org. Well, you know, I had not done a gala. I know how to do festivals and we had the Essence television show and the Essence Awards, so I knew how to produce and you know, work on those things. But Gloria Steinem was a great inspiration for me because I think it was for her 60th or 50th birthday, Gloria decided she was going to have a gala and it was going to fund the Ms. Foundation and it was successful. So I said to our board, I think I should do that for my 70th birthday. And they said, well, okay. And we, we went for it. And it really was so successful because, you know, a lot of the folks across the country really grew up with me. And they couldn't believe that I was turning 70, but all they had to do was do the math. So now my 75th birthday, Jean, I don't know where the time goes. Lord of mercy. Oh, Leave you look alone. so young. Oh my God, please. 75. You really look amazing. I, no one would ever think that you're going to turn 75. Yeah. So getting well, back to the gala, it's January 23rd. I assume it's virtual. You're going to have a lot of celebrities involved like you always do. Tell us more. Well, that's what it's, what it's going to be. I mean, we've been, usually it's a Cipriani, you know, that's where we've been. And I just said, you know, we're not going to not do it. Alicia Keys is going to be with us and Danny Glover and a whole host of other people. And well, it's going to be short. You know, our gallows can be two and a half hours, so we don't have to feed anybody, and we can use all the money that we that we make to try to change lives. They are graduating young people from schools in our New York City who are reading at a second grade level. If you're reading at a second grade level and you're graduating from high school, you know where you're going to end up. You cannot find a job. You're going to end up committing a crime, and you're going to end up in prison. And so what we're trying to do is really just damp that prison pipeline. So the gala is really, it's a fabulous night. Um, I can send you the information and people, you can go to our website, caresmentoring.org and people can come on board and see. We love corporate sponsorship. Right now, the um, highest level is $100,000 and FedEx is at that level, bless them. A Robert Smith, the philanthropist probably will come back again. He was an honoree last year, our honoree. Uh, this year, we're not gonna honor people. I wanna keep it short. And we have others, uh, Bloomberg is a supporter, AARP and, and several others, you know? So it's a group of inspiration and fabulousness. And it says, you know, even when we are doing it live, we can dress up and we can have a great time and do good work like you do. Well, thank you. And one of the charities that I'm involved with, New York City Mission Society, we have after school programs and then we have summer programs. We are based in Harlem with the same idea to help reinforce education and bring young people forward so that they can create a life with a good job and, and get out there and earn a, earn a living. And it's so needed. Now, Susan, you've also authored many books. And I understand you 
even authored one with your husband or you worked with him or he helped you. How did, how did that work out? You want to know the truth? Each other's back or did it happen? Oh Lord, we fought. I can tell you that, you know, I had written several books before and he had as well. So now the publishers wanted us to do what was the confirmation, the spiritual wisdom that has shaped our lives. And a lot of people turn to it uh, before they get married and people give it as wedding gifts. But we fought. My husband is an intellectual, you know, and, and I think everything that he does is very, it's very what? It's highbrow. It is for the very small audience of people who can understand the, the words that, that he uses and, and, and the concepts. I'm used to speaking to a broad audience, a very broad audience, a popular audience. So he thought mine was gonna be mundane and I thought his was gonna be so erudite that nobody could understand it. So after we fought a little bit, we met in the middle and we really created a very good book, I must say. <laughs> Meeting in the middle, that's so important, you know, to not believe and, you're always right. And how can our viewers buy one of your books? Are you on Amazon and Barnes and Noble or do you sell privately? Because people during this period, during this horrible pandemic, we have time on our hands and people want to learn. All my books are at Amazon. They're all on amazon.com. The one that I think most people turn to is In the Spirit. In the Spirit, the spiritual, no, that's right, In the Spirit. It really comes from the writings that I did over years at Essence. And that really kind of elevated my popularity. Because at that time, Jean, when I became editor-in-chief of the magazine in 1981, there were no writings in popular magazines in this nation or probably anywhere in the world that were about spirituality. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't come to that, that publication and that job with a lot of confidence. I was the beauty and fashion editor. I hadn't gone to college when I became the editor in chief of the magazine. I was like, I'm succeeding, Marsha Ann Gillespie, what could I ever write about? But I just, you're gonna write about what you care about most and what you know, spirituality. And it just was amazing how popular that column became. I did go back to school, Fordham University. I was well into my editor chi uh, editorship. I've pro ship. I was probably, gosh, 40, my late 40s when I went back to school and I went nights and early mornings and weekends. And then I went on to Union Theological Seminary. So I, you know, went back to school. But I, and that's just for us to say that it's never too late to do anything that you have in heart and mind. So interesting. And it sounds like you're a religious woman and that religion and, and God has played a role in your, in your success and, and in your, in everything you do. And I, I like that very much. And what words would you give to someone just beginning their career? Here we are in the middle of a pandemic. Millions of people have lost their jobs. Millions of people are on food lines. We have a situation in our country where Feeding America says five, uh, 50 million people are food insecure, which means they don't have enough food for their families. What advice do you give to someone just starting out? I'd like to hear, and I would want you to tell our audience, because we have many young people who watch this show, and they want to hear from someone like you. You are a leader for sure. You're a leader in the Black community. You're someone that so many people look up to. You've done a lot. Sounds like you've worked 24-7 your entire life. So we want to hear from you, Susan. Well, I mean, I, I'm not a religious person. I grew up going to Catholic schools. And I would say that what I've learned, I never heard. I, I grew up during Vatican I. So we went to, to church seven days a week. The nuns took attendance. But I never heard that there was anything divine about me. I thought the nuns and the priests had the direct line to the Holy Spirit. What I, what I learned and what I would impart to young people is that you really are more than enough and that you have everything you need within you. And not just to young people. Life is not a playground, it's a schoolroom. And we're not punished for our mistakes. That's our invention of the entity we call God. We think about this punishing God, you make a mistake and you're gonna burn in hell. That's the kind of thing that I kind of learned that my father was a sinner because he didn't go to Catholic church every Sunday. He was a Methodist, you know, came from the Caribbean. So I would want 
young people and all of us to remember. I say this, it's easy to speak it. It's more difficult to write it. It's ever more challenging to live it. That life is a flow and we want to get in that flow. There are times our lives fall apart. We fall off the raft. You know, we skin our heads, we bump our knees on the rocks, but we can always get back on that raft and in the flow again. It's never too late to really get going again and to not give up hope. And that's what we do. We give up hope when trouble comes. Nobody lives this life without struggle. And so true. And for our viewers, we are with Susan Taylor. She was the head of Essence Magazine for 37 years as editor-in-chief for 17 of those years. And Susan's been talking about her life, the, the work she's done with her mentoring charity, the book she's written, and then been giving advice and a little advice from Jean Schaffer off to our young viewers. Believe in yourself. If you make a mistake, pick yourself up and go forward. We all make mistakes. None of us are perfect. No one is going to criticize you and put you down because you made a mistake when you were younger. We all make mistakes. You get up and you believe in yourself. And Susan, one final word. You are such an inspiration. Moving forward, what are your plans? We have 50 seconds. Oh, Jean, I have 50 seconds. I... Let me underscore what you just said, you know, that people may criticize you, but I always say that what people feel about me is none of my business. So your business is your wellness, your health, your emotional wellness. That's what I want to leave people with. Work on your emotional wellness, because when you're emotionally well, everything else works in what I call divine right order. That's really so well put. This concludes Successful Philanthropy. Today, our guest, Susan Taylor. I'm Jean Schafroff, your host. I'll see you next week. One third, One -third of, of all, all black, black children, children are living in poverty. Living in poverty. And the leading cause of death for our boys, for our young black men, is homicide. homicide. Become a mentor. Help to secure the most vulnerable among us, our beloved children. So I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Are you? Log on to caresmentoring.org and get connected to a CARES affiliate near you.